Safe and secure from the traffic of the east side, this lesser known slope of the Tetons has quickly become close to my heart. The heavy influence of agriculture, it keeps the pace rather slow, and all the folks in the area, they just seem to be your friend. This magic corner of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is no secret to the devoted disciples of trout. In fact, this might be Mecca to most. Mountains meet fields while the rivers cut through thriving wildlife corridors. And if you listen, whispers of bird-sized bugs being vacuumed up by flashes of rainbow and brown give more than a few creeks on this west side the moniker of world famous. I mean, that looks, that looks so fishy right there. Fishing opportunities during the more favorable summer months can bring a lot of fanfare. But no matter how much clout is attached, spring in this part of the world has a tendency to be rather fickle. Flowing water, well-fed fish, and the fluctuating temperature can flop the fervor of any fly angler looking to part ways with the symptoms of cabin fever. I was given a golden opportunity that I just could not pass up, so I'm here in eastern Idaho. I'm scouting around. I'm looking for my favorite high water hideaways, some diamonds in the rough that can still be fished even when the water's high. So I hope you stick with, stay tuned, and yeah, enjoy. We're going to be exploring eastern Idaho. Snowcap peaks seemed to be giving way to more comfortable temperatures, and slowly but surely, summer was working its way up the Rockies. But we all know there's no such thing as a free lunch. With the kiss of strong sun comes the unmistakable sound of rushing water. I spent the entire afternoon driving around to all my favorite spots in the area, and on top of stream closures for spawning native trout, water conditions were looking grim across the board. The fields and flowers were dancing to the tune of summer, even though the water was clearly running on spring. As frustrating as this was, I couldn't help but smile and soak in the heat of the sun, carrying that sweet sound and smell of a Teton summer on the wind. Something about a warm breeze just sets my mind at ease. Dare I say, it makes me feel fine. I was feeling hopeful I could turn this trip around regardless of the subpar conditions. Walking back to the truck, I started to daydream of a very different time in a rather familiar place. Eastern Idaho has been more than kind to me over the years, and I spent a decent time here after college, but that feels like a different lifetime now. Just one year ago, however, I made it back, and I was lucky enough to spend two entire months exploring the side of the state, and this time, I made sure to bring a camera along. There are only a few places in my travels that have moved me like this. With the pure width and breadth of options for any angler of any level, it's hard to stay away from the east side of the state. Just a short drive from any of the major towns like Idaho Falls, Rexburg, and especially Tetonia, the frequency of my adventures over the subsequent weeks were only governed by the setting sun. Now, don't get me wrong, some of the more well-known rivers like the Henry's Fork they were choked up with drift boats carried by trailers from all over the country. Even though I had to avoid the major systems coming off the Snake River, I found endless opportunities where the blacktop ends and the boat ramps are no more. During the weeknights, I could find solitude in any number of creeks flowing off the lesser known west side of the Tetons. The only barrier to entry to these systems was your willingness to walk and your propensity for adventure. You have to be mindful of farmers' fields, but for the most part, I was nothing but impressed with the public access to a lot of these wild rivers. I had more than a few crazy, and I mean crazy, nights climbing in and out of seldom seen rivers and pursuing fishing opportunities that would rival most anything in the lower 48. With long days, you can turn any work week session into a memorable outing and still be home before dark. During the weekends, however, I could spread my wings a bit more and explore more backcountry options. Tributaries of massive reservoirs and tiny headwater trickles up in the peaks each have their own appeal, and with how nutrient rich this part of the world tends to be, even the small water can hold big fish. With bug life abound, cutthroat, rainbows, browns, and whitefish are all eager to eat 
and present in both quantity and quality. All these memories are cemented in my mind, and maybe you can kind of see why a place like this is so high on my list to revisit. That's why I couldn't be more thankful for Jet Hospitality and Teton Peaks Resort for making this week happen. They really enjoy all my shenanigans I find myself getting into and offered to help me out with this trip. They hooked me up with an amazing lodge suite with an even better view. Just enough room for all my junk and the perfect base camp to stage all my fishy adventures from, but I'll make sure to talk about them a bit more later on in the video. Even though conditions were far from ideal in the moment, this little trip down memory lane gave me a few ideas and a decent game plan moving forward. I had one week to find some fish, and my hopes were high, and my legs, they were ready to run. Rain in the forecast threatened to put a real damper on my first night's fishing adventure. The countdown, it had officially begun, and I had about a week to explore and attempt to figure things out. That first scouting session, it was good, but I needed to get a better feel for the area, and when in Rome, it would almost be a shame to ignore a river so famous as the Henry's Fork. Whoa. I mean, that looks, that looks so fishy right there. I almost guarantee this, there's gotta be fish in there. This doesn't look half bad at all. Feeling good about this decision, it only seemed right to go over and give the waterfall a quick look before casting into this tumbling torrent. Clearly the water was up, and this immense force of nature was still ripping along with the intensity of spring runoff. Despite this, clues along the river gave me hope I had a caster's chance of finding a few fish. Discarded husks the size of my pinky finger were strewn across any rock, twig, or open stretch of bank. Really, anywhere that could allow for some undisturbed wing flapping was occupied like a crowded parking lot. It would seem as though I'd missed this iconic hatch on the Henry's Fork by just a few days, and going into this trip, I knew the peak of the salmon fly hatch had more than passed at this point point, but I had to imagine if the signs of bugs were here, the fish ought to be in close proximity. So I cast it at any fishy looking water until the local bloodsuckers tracked me down and decided to get acquainted with my exposed skin. Can't believe it's already that time of the year. It is so buggy. Still with no fish to my name and more bug bites than I care to admit, my initial feelings on this stretch of river were slowly starting to shift. I have a bad tendency to bail out too early when my gut tells me hooking into a fish is trending towards tough. So instead of running right away, I kept moving upstream, hunting for any sort of structure, soft water, or current break where a wily fish might be held up. From afar, this run seemed to be the ticket. However, all I found instead were menacing looking storm clouds. Getting some really swirly winds right now. Could be good for the fishing, but that could be bad for old Magoo. I don't know how much longer I'm gonna push this. I mean, it's buggy as all get out. I just have not seen anything in the fish department. So, might give this one a fish and then maybe uh, keep this dog and pony show going. One heavy pit grew as the plume of angry clouds seemed to be growing exponentially in front of me. If I were to leave right at this exact moment, the longer days would allow for at least one more scouting option to finish out my day. So with no real reservations about leaving, it was back to the truck and back on the road. Shocked to see there were no other vehicles in sight, I slipped under the culvert bridge as my hopes were again slowly building back up. A couple hundred feet of elevation drop and thick brush busting were the only thing standing between me and one of my all-time favorite rivers. And I get it, it seems a bit early in the trip to be exploring my best option, but I was in the neighborhood and very much wanted to catch a few fish before I headed home. Emerging through the thick vegetation, Ride of the Valkyrie started playing in my mind as I finally laid eyes on what I was after. No more empty shells of what once was, no. This was the real deal, folks. Bird-sized bugs crisscrossed the Warm River Canyon like Boeing 747s lumbering towards their final destination. Again, I didn't feel like my chances were great of seeing this legendary hatch, so just getting to witness the spectacle alone and putting eyes on an adult salmon fly made this first night's outing more than worth it already. Ooh, the bugs are so bad right now. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm getting crushed by bugs right now. It is unbelievably buggy. I'm I mean, doing my best, but golly jumps, they're getting me good. 
Prep work behind the scenes usually pays off for me in the long run, so a fresh dry fly leader was burning a hole in my pocket, and with shaky hands, I unraveled my salmon fly and simulator combo, hoping this would be the ticket. There we go. That's on the salmon fly. I'm gonna get him on pin real quick here. That big fly munching brown was the first domino in this surefire plan B. Unaffected by runoff and absolutely swarming with massive bugs, these canyon fish were strictly in the business of eating anything they could find. With relatively clear water, I was able to see these canyon rainbows start to finish, abandon their boulder hideouts on their way up to attack my oversized flies floating helplessly by. Fishing for trout that are actually keyed in on a certain hatch is one of the more satisfying things for anglers, especially when those fish happen to be feeding on salmon flies. The only problem with this hole right here is that a lot of the fish in it, they were a little too small to actually engulf the fly, so I miss a lot of fish. And I did have a chance at a few of the bigger fish, but over eager hook sets, they really got the best of me. Despite the slight frustration, I was really only looking for one fish on the night, so all those little rainbows, they were a healthy scoop of gravy on top of this already great night. Their wild colors were glowing in the twilight of the canyon sunset, but after harassing this first pool for some time now, I knew it might be a good idea to move up further and try another spot. Doesn't this look fun? Well, I can feel the jitters of the day starting to get the best of me, and uh, between that and the mosquitoes, I'm, uh, I'm about ready to call this one, but this has been an absolute, I would say, big time success. I'm gonna try a couple more holes in here because, uh, yeah, we gotta be getting out of here very, very soon because we gotta go up fast. I had a few more small rainbows come up and smack my dry, but none of them could stay pinned. And really, I'd push my luck a little too far on this first night as is. So with what little time I had left, it was time to make hiking out the main concern. Whew, it's a long way down. Well, to the noise of that water and the mosquitoes, I didn't really feel like talking much down there. But got them on the salmon flies, the stimmy, and the dry dropper. There's not much more you can ask for that. Especially, I mean, it is tough right now. I've been all over the place scouting for spots. And this is, I don't know, I'd say our second to last scouting session, maybe. I might have a couple more in the tank. But uh, I think we might have found our ace in the hole. For this coming weekend and hopefully hopefully things don't change too much hopefully the salmon flies are still buzzing around and they're eating on top of it yeah gotta bid this lovely river valley farewell and get out of town because i got uh, a couple minutes of sunlight left before it's going to be dark on me so yeah this is a success let's go Heavy spring rains coming over the Tetons kept me pinned down over the next few days, but with just enough heat from the fireplace, I was able to dry out most of my gear before my next adventure. Clearer forecasts were soon to follow, and I figured if it wasn't broken, why try to fix it at this point? It was time to go back to the Warm River Canyon. Followed a healthy line of boot prints up the road, I couldn't help but think how nice it was to see a bunch of kids playing a timeless game like Marco Polo. I gotta say, it makes me feel old as hell, but I can still remember rambunctious days rabble rousing with my cousins all under the watchful eye of grandma or grandpa. But as you can see, the trail was starting to get a bit more crowded, and with the weekend approaching fast, I had to imagine it would only continue to swell. Those railroad companies of old sure did work hard to make a smooth track to extract valuable natural resources from the surrounding hills. Makes me wonder how they'd feel about all that hard work being pushed off the mountain and used as a hiking trail instead. Stacks of discarded railway rubble covered the lichen-strewn boulders all along the Warm River Canyon. Being a bit further upstream from where I was yesterday, things had boxed up considerably, which made maneuvering quite precarious and a touch dangerous at times. My best advice to anyone looking to come to this kind of an environment is to mind your step and ideally go with a friend. One rough tumble or a shifting rock could result in a whole lot of trouble, and the sound of the rushing water will muffle your cries for help to anyone on the path. I hate to sound too doom and gloom because the juice in these kind of situations is usually 
usually with the squeeze. My general approach when it comes to fishing is somewhat similar to yesterday, toss big bugs with one rod and clean things up with a dry dropper on the other. From up top on the trail, this section may look like a bunch of featureless whitewater and don't get me wrong, the majority of it really is. But there are plenty of pockets and plunge pools that can hold any number of fish. Just with the twisting and turning of the river, these little harbors are quite common on either side of the bank, and if you take a look underneath the bubble line, you can get a better perspective of what these fish are working with. The speed of the tumbling water requires these canyon fish to make quick decisions about when and where they eat. Oftentimes, they can't choose to be picky. Getting into the groove of the evening bite, I was finding a fair amount of fish. Granted, they all seemed to be on the lower end of that size spectrum, but just finding fish during this time of the year was a blessing all in itself. My game plan carried over from yesterday was working like an absolute charm. Now, I gotta say, I've fished this canyon a few times prior and had similar results. However, from what I've read and researched, there's a lot of information pointing towards bigger fish hiding in these boulder pools. It might have been a bit late in the outing to change out to a streamer, but as soon as I did, I managed to get some follows from some of those elusive upper tier fish. Oh my god, that was a huge fish. God, that was a big fish. Oh, there he is. Oh, that's not the big fish. This is a little fish. This must be where everybody fishes. Good lord. That's a run right there, bud. This hardworking spider marked the end of the canyon, and outside of relocating this mylar balloon from its final resting place, all I had to do was hike out before the sun fully set. This was my last weeknight session before I could experience the freedom of the weekend. Overall, I'd say things went well. I mean, for Pete's sake, I found plenty of fish and got to explore my favorite parts of eastern Idaho. But walking down the forgotten rail line, I felt the nag of dissatisfaction tugging at my decision making. Water levels were still far from ideal, but I was staying smack dab in the middle of the fishiest country the lower 48 has to offer. I did the math and there was just enough time left at Teton Peaks Resort to take a risk. I felt like Sunday would give me more than enough time to salvage plans if somehow things went horribly wrong, and in the twilight of this pristine Idaho evening, I made the poor decision to roll the dice and revisit the Henry's Fork on Saturday. Sunrise start was in order as I locked up and headed north from the lodge. The roads were surprisingly empty and the temperatures were rather low. Eerie fog lifting off the water made me feel a touch weird about my first full day fishing here in eastern Idaho. Cool. Well, here we are. Here I was again, sitting on the banks of the world-renowned Henry's Fork. Fishy omens were hanging on nearly every open surface and in quite impressive numbers, but then again, so were the signs of angling pressure. Truth be told, I didn't really know what I was expecting. I guess a fish would have been nice. You always read this and that about the ridiculous fish numbers per mile on creeks like this. Depending on the time and depending on the place, they've observed thousands of fish per mile in the old Henry's Fork. But knee deep in the sobering cold, I could feel my boots slowly slipping in my losing battle with the powerful current. My dumb angling mind tends to stay idling in the physical world. You could say I'm just a bad believer, because I need tangible proof of fish. A rise? Maybe an eager jump? Hell, I would have taken the flash of a whitefish at this point. At the end of the day, I cannot run my roots. I'm a Missouri boy. You gotta show me. Outside of lapping water and the whistles of empty double halls, the river was painfully quiet. Nervous jitters worked up my spine and got my mind moving down a negative track. I said to myself, could it be too much pressure? Maybe it's easy access. Picky fish? Full fish too cold? 
What the heck could it be? I'm well aware wade fishing in the land of drift boats isn't exactly the most efficient way to attack a river like this, but despite that fact, I was still able to access fairly fishy water. Current breaks in the middle of the river were as lifeless as the exposed boulders closer to the bank. I think I know what a bite feels like at this point, and I went a few hours without so much as a tug. I felt like I needed a change of scenery. Not too far up the trail was supposed to be a choppier bend and maybe better fishing. But as soon as I settled in and got to casting, the first dreaded drift boat slid around the corner and into my line of sight. Now I know how these conga lines go, I've seen it all too many times before. Not but a few minutes after that first one flowed by, there was another one soon to follow. My gut knew better. My lust for bigger fish had led me right into a less than ideal situation. I had no interest in competing with a million boats today, so it was time to scramble. Back to the truck and back to the drawing board. Boy howdy, this is where things really started to fall apart for me. Beauty abound, this was a stretch of the Henry's Fork I'd never seen before, and considerably further upstream from my first spot and dumping into the Island Park Reservoir, it was clear these flows aren't as closely managed. I was trudging through flooded fields well before I could lay eyes on the river itself. Once it did come back into view, this section was blown out beyond belief, and I was back to square one. Large figures weaving under the surface gave my heart a brief flurry, but I soon realized they were just some sort of sucker species. My best guess from my overhead view was roving schools of large-scale suckers. They all looked to be staging for some sort of spawning event and completely disinterested in any fly I was throwing. The only silver lining in this plan B was finding this cool frog. Otherwise, it was a waste. On to the next. Arguably an even worse situation, I was wrapping up a brief re-rig when a pair of California plates pulled up no less than 25 feet in front of me and decided to jump in. Gave me eye contact and everything, but did not give a single care. High hold and still fishless on the Henry's Fork, I didn't even entertain this river any further. Running short on time and increasingly short on spots, my plan C was blown out and unfishable. Strike one, strike two, and now strike three had me feeling like a real loser. There was so much good fishing in the area and I couldn't seem to find a break if it jumped into my truck and smacked me across the face. On my way back to the lodge, I did a Hail Mary area search in the off chance there would be something worth checking for a short evening session on the water. Lo and behold, I followed a trail of breadcrumbs all the way up to a seemingly fishable river. Okie I think we have arrived. This is fishable. This is fishable for sure. Just like that, he's gone. Very nice, the skunk is off. By the grace of God and a dash of good luck, the ever pungent stench of skunk was whisked away on a humid breeze. The air smelled like rain and my hands finally smelled like fish. And by no means was this the best option, but just knowing there were fish present in the system gave me a great deal of solace moving forward. A few more small brown trout were weaved into my future, but the water was awfully cold, and each of their sluggish tugs made it difficult to distinguish the difference between that or the bottom of the river or just some rock. A few bends above, I was given a lovely little surprise, all wrapped up in beautiful marbling and spotted nose to tail with pars. This amicable brook trout was quite comfortable with the camera and ended up hanging around for quite some time as the rushing water gently revived his spirits. I bid the small char bon voyage and began to bust brush back to the truck. My nose seemed to be onto something because the sound of thunder was grumbling something awful just a few ridges away. After this roller coaster of a day, I felt like I deserved to stuff my gut with any and all diner food and plan for my last day here in Idaho. No longer afraid of being called a one-trick pony, I moseyed my way back to the same familiar parking lot. This little dance was starting to become something close to routine, so I was saddled up and heading down the old rail lines in no time flat.
It's sad to think this is my last morning here in Idaho. It's been great, but I'm gonna make the most out of what little time I have, and fingers crossed we can at least get a few fish, so let's go. Really fighting me. Nice, yes. All right, and he is back. And for some of you out there who may not be familiar with what that fish was. That's what's called a mountain whitefish. There's a ton of whitefish species all throughout the world, I think. But these are actually native to the rivers and streams in this part of Idaho and most of the mountain west for that part. But they are a keystone species. They are a native species. And it's cool to see them kind of thriving. Well, I don't know if they're thriving, but they're still here alongside the invasive browns and rainbows. Whereas the cutthroat, they've kind of uh, taken a backseat, at least in this system. But yeah, I could seriously catch those all day. They fight like hell. And yeah, if they're willing to eat a fly, I <laughs> got no issue with them. So yeah, let's see if we can keep uh, keep going up this run and yeah, see what else this uh, lower section has to offer. God, they're dogging, man. That's a big white fish. Holy smokes. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> this thing is freaking huge. Holy smokes. You got that thing right where you want it. Killer adipose. I mean, <laughs> dude, come on. Hopefully I can outrun the mosquitoes for just a little bit and stop and talk about really the whole reason I'm here. Of course, I love Eastern Idaho and everything that it has to offer, but getting up here can kind of be tough and even this time of year, even tougher. But a few months ago, I had a company reach out to me called Jet Hospitality and I'll put their logo up right here. And uh, yeah, they run all sorts of properties all throughout the West. So basically from Washington to Montana and everywhere in between, they've got a wide range and a kind of a spectrum of different options between like where I'm staying, kind of a lodge suite to tiny homes, glamping. I mean, they, they really have it all. It's pretty neat. So they reached out to me and said, hey, we want to put you up, come out to Eastern Idaho and do some fishing. And so, yeah, I cannot be you know, more thankful for Jet number one and then number two, Teton Peaks Resort for hosting me and yeah, they've treated me like a damn king. I don't I don't quite uh, have the words to say thank you enough, but yeah, it's been amazing. And what's cool about Tetonia, where Teton Peaks Resort is located is, well, number one, you're right up against the Tetons. It's like right there. And number two, I think it's on the better side of the Tetons. You know, you've got Jackson and kind of the kitschy side on the Wyoming side, but here on the, the Idaho side, things are a little bit more chill. Things. I don't know, I, I like it a little bit more just because it's not as crowded or as, I don't know, yeah, it's kitschy. But anyway, there's so much to see, so much to do. Tetonia is close enough to Idaho Falls or Rexburg or Ashton, wherever you need to go to get things, be it groceries, restaurants, supplies, any, anything really. And then it's really close to great hiking, fishing, sightseeing, everything you could possibly want and more. And even when it's kind of tough, like right now in the spring, there's not much to be had in the fishing department at least. I'm still out here finding fish and there's nobody else out here. So yeah, it's just, this has been an amazing experience. And again, I cannot thank them enough. So I hate to be too pluggy, but if you have any interest in coming here and enjoying it yourself, 
I've got it listed down below, so go check them out. They're really good, they've treated me well, and yeah, I can't, uh, again, can't think of enough, but we've got a couple more hours here in Eastern Idaho. Might as well soak up as much of it as we possibly can, so let's keep this ball rolling. Getting to a nice bend on the corridor, the current started to pick up again, and it seemed like the river would plunge into another canyon. Finally feeling validated about bringing my streamer rod along, I tossed out a flashy white offering in the hopes of a fishy follower too. Oh, eat it, 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 eat it. Oh, that was a trap. That must have been a trap. Oh, 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 oh my gosh. Why didn't that set? Why didn't that set? There it is. That's a trout. That is 100% a trout. Oh, tell me that's a brown. Yes. Nice. Look at you, buckaroo. It might not seem like much, especially in the land of the giants, but my God, this brown was a phenomenal specimen. The golden backdrop was the perfect canvas for the smattering of red, white, and black covering the entirety of this fish. Plus, that's classic brown trout behavior quite literally coming out of the woodworks to attack a helpless bait fish swinging by. I would go as far to say it's almost undeniable. That's just good clean fun right there, folks. It's always nice when you can get a streamer bite. I knew there were some browns in here, but I didn't figure they'd be in this fast stuff. And it's so interesting how, you know, just one bend over, nothing but whitefish. And finally getting some faster water, it's like that. Two hits and then boom, that guy bit, so. That's super cool, maybe we can get a couple more. My greedy mind couldn't help but think a few more trout would have been nice, but the sun was starting to get high and Sunday was only ever meant to be a morning session. A few more runs pulled up nothing of interest, so it was time to turn around and get back to the lodge. Now this march back was a lot easier said than done of course, especially when tired legs were quite tired of carrying heavy boots. That first fall hurt, but this second spill rattled my bones. It would seem as though I was certainly paying the piper at this point, but hey, that is fine by me. My time in Eastern Idaho was officially over and a twinge of melancholy tugged at my heart once I hit flatland. I truly love this part of the state and undoubtedly will be looking for any excuse to make it back as soon as possible. Well, here we are folks. If you have made it to this point in the video, then that means it is all over. The adventure is done. And all I have to say is thank you so very much for sticking around and watching this all the way to the end. I mean, I know it's good for the algorithm, all this blah blah gobbledygook that I don't understand, but your support really means the world to me and I, I feel weird because I'm literally alone in a canyon talking to a black box, but I'm doing my best to uh, imagine you, the viewer, sitting there. So you, thank you so much. It means the world that you you know, like these kind of videos and can relate to the silly adventures I find myself in. But before I skedaddle and before I get freaking eaten alive by mosquitoes, I gotta say a couple thank yous. Number one, to the folks on Patreon, helping creators like myself kind of, yeah, get out and do this sort of stuff. I mean, it's not cheap, there's a lot involved, and I'm not saying that the money matters, but it certainly helps, be it that tank of gas or that fly line, it's, it's awesome. And kind of dovetailing off of that would be all the various brands that I work with and the folks that I choose to work with, I don't know if I really see them as brands. I see them more as friends. I talk to them regularly. They're kind of smaller operations, kind of like myself. So I appreciate what they do for me so much. I trust their stuff and I would not promote it otherwise. So I hope you realize that, yeah, I do get approached with a lot of stuff and <laughs> I turn down a ton of stuff because I don't know, if I don't use it, I don't want to promote it. So every single one of these brands, I personally trust and again they're doing great things for anglers like myself and maybe for folks like you too so whew, i think that might be it i don't know oh right yeah one last thing wherever you find yourself be it in the beautiful side of eastern idaho or in your backyard i sure hope you keep those feet in the water and until next time tight lines